This is the twelfth in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential systems. In the last lecture, we discussed the characteristics of systems of partial differential equations. And in this lecture, we want to discuss the characteristics of exterior differential systems uh, when we think of them as systems of partial differential equations. So let's give a definition of the characteristic variety of an exterior differential system. And I'll leave the, the, the student to investigate why this definition corresponds to the definition we wrote down in partial differential equations. To prove the equivalence of these definitions is a problem in the lecture notes, and the solution is given in the back in case you can't see how to get it to work out. So let's start with an uh, integral element E, which is p-dimensional, an integral element of an exterior differential system I. A hyperplane in E is said to be characteristic if it also lies in some other integral element, E p prime, not equal to E p, so also p dimensional, um, but not the same one. So again, this is this is this is a definition which is rather different from the definition we had last time for partial differential equations, which was defined in terms of of looking at at wave momenta. Um, the characteristic variety here is the set of characteristic hyperplanes. And um, I leave you to check that that corresponds to the notion for PDEs. Now, why would we be interested in this kind of a thing? Here's at least some motivation, some intuition for how we can think about characteristics. An integral element is supposed to be thought of as something like an infinitesimal integral manifold. And similarly, an and in a characteristic hyperplane should be thought of as something like an infinitesimal characteristic hypersurface, where a characteristic hypersurface means a hypersurface in an integral manifold, all of whose tangent planes are characteristic. So if we had a characteristic hypersurface, we would expect that there might there would be two integral manifolds. Each of its tangent planes lies in two different integral elements, at least. So we'd expect that maybe it lies in two different integral manifolds. Again, there's no rigor behind that, but it gives us some sort of uh, expectation, some, uh, some intuition for what's happening here. Um, so that means that the characteristic hyperservice could be thought of as a kind of a, a possible non-tangential intersection of integral manifolds. It might be a non-tangential intersection of integral manifolds. Again, no rigor, but some intuitive sense that we have these two different integral manifolds slicing through one another non-tangentially. If you cut them along the, or they, along their intersection, you could glue one to the other along that intersection, creating a kind of crease along the, uh, along that, along the integral manifold. You'd produce an integral manifold that wasn't very smooth. It had a sharp crease along it. And that gives us some sense of what characteristics represent, the possibility to crease integral manifolds or to produce, in other words, very, very uh, si sharp singular uh, folds in them. So integral manifolds are more flexible. They, they fold or bend more easily along the characteristic hypersurfaces. And again, that's just a rough intuition. We don't have any theorem to prove a thing like that. After all, to, to make sense out of that, we might have to even go outside the world of, of uh, smooth integral manifolds. And that seems to be something we're not uh, maybe ready to do at the moment. So um, so this gives us, anyway, some feeling for what characteristics represent a kind of flexibility, an ability to bend things in those, uh, along those hypersurfaces. Now we can try to state the cauchy kovalevsky theorem as a theorem about exterior differential systems, it, rather than the PDE version that we had before. You'll recall we had two different PDE versions uh, in, the, in the last lecture, we started with the cauchy kovalevsky theorem stated for systems in Cauchy form in coordinates. And we ended up uh, ultimately describing the cauchy kovalevsky theorem for systems where we didn't really need to have some coordinates uh, defined. Instead, we just talked about being determined about the determinacy of the equation uh, of the system of partial differential equations. Um, so we'll have a, a determinacy criterion here as well. An integral element of an exterior differential system, so some EPs of a system I, is determined if it contains a non-characteristic hyperplane and the dimension of the space of P forms in the ideal I at, evaluated at the point M. 
is the sum of the characters s naught up to s p minus one for m uh, for any point m of our manifold which lies near the point m naught where the integral element lives. Those characters s naught s one and so on up to s p minus one are calculated at the integral element e p at the point m naught. But we want to have make sure that the p forms everywhere nearby have the same dimension at each in each um, cotangent space at each point m. So that's the um, the criterion for being determined. And recall there was a similar criterion for PDEs. The PDEs were determined if they had a non-characteristic hyperplane and if the symbol matrix was square. So you can, again, you can check in coordinates that square symbol matrix corresponds exactly to this particular um, equation on the, on the, the, the P-forms. This, uh, th this is something, again, I leave you to check and uh, once again, it's uh, it's a problem in the lecture notes, and the solution is uh, as is given in the back of the notes. So that's what we will call determinacy, and it corresponds uh, in in coordinates to determinacy of system of the system of partial differential equations for p-dimensional integral manifolds. So here's the Cauchy-Kapelevsky theorem, written in this language. We take a non-characteristic integral manifold. So that means that. It's each tangent plane is a non-characteristic hyperplane in an integral element, and therefore in a unique integral element. Um, now we suppose that every tangent space is a hyperplane in a determined integral element, and then um, we so determinacy being this condition we've written here uh, about the sum of the uh, the sum of the characters giving the dimension of the p-forms. Then we can apply Cauchy-Kapelevsky theorem, and x is a hypersurface in an integral manifold. So we can fatten it up from being p minus one dimensional to being a p dimensional integral manifold, as long as we have this uh, condition of being non non characteristicity and and determinacy, we can fatten things up. And the uh, the integral manifold of dimension p is locally unique, which means that any two of them will agree near enough to x. So. Uh, so this gives us a, a, a version of the cauchy kapelevsky theorem, which, uh, which is described in the language of exterior differential systems. And we can see that it's a little bit better than the cauchy kapelevsky theorem as stated when we stated it originally in Cauchy form. We had a somewhat, somewhat weaker result in that um, in, this, in this situation, this, this non-characteristic integral manifold x p minus 1 might be very large in some sense. It might not live in a single coordinate chart. There's no use of coordinates here. So we don't need to worry about whether or not there's a single coordinate chart in which we can write x down. And that means we, we aren't really um, working out uh, an equation in Cauchy form, but we're, we're saying that if you pick a point of, 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 this, of this integral manifold x, you can f find some coordinates in which this uh, construction of this integral manifold becomes a, a Cauchy problem in Cauchy form. And then uh, by uniqueness, by, by the local uniqueness property, you can glue those local solutions together to produce a global solution. So this means that we can allow a non-characteristic integral manifold xp minus 1, which is so huge that it doesn't fit in a single coordinate chart. It's so complicated that it, it's, it's maybe too messy to write down any, any kind of formula but in, in any coordinates, but nevertheless, we can ensure that it can be used as initial data for constructing a solution. So this gives us a kind of result that's kind of uh, somewhat global, at least in the initial data. The initial data manifold X is, uh, is allowed to be a global object. It doesn't have to be described just in a little local coordinate chart. So let's tie an example, see if we can apply this to an actual problem. So we're not using Cauchy, uh, the cartan kaler theorem now. We're just using cauchy kovalevsky theorem, as I've stated it. So we've got to try to see an example where we can construct uh, using we can construct an integral manifold using only that uh, cauchy kovalevsky theorem. Let's look at triply orthogonal webs. Take a surface S in Euclidean three-dimensional space, and let's see if we can build a triply orthogonal web with initial data specified along that surface. Let's pick an orthonormal basis, E1, E2, E3, at each point of S 
analytically varying as we move along s. And uh, we'll assume that these E1, E2, and E3 are defined only along the points of the surface s. They f at each point of the surface s, they form an orthonormal basis of, of Euclidean three-dimensional space, but the, the basis um, can vary. It can vary analytically as we move along s, and it's only defined, such a basis only defined at the points of s. And we'll assume that none, none of E1, E2, or E3 is, is anywhere tangent to S, okay, at any point. So there's no point of S at which w any one of those three vectors becomes tangent. So given such an orthonormal system along S, we want to claim there is a triply orthogonal web defined near S, whose leaves are perpendicular to E1, E2, and E3 um, along S. So we can use E1, E2, and E3 as initial data to be to represent the normals of of the leaves of this triply orthogonal web. And any two such triply orthogonal webs agree near S. So there's an existence and uniqueness result. Again, this is different from what we proved previously about triply orthogonal webs, because what we did previously was just to show that there exists a large collection of triply orthogonal webs. Um, that they depend on so many functions of so many variables. Uh, in this case, we're actually able to write down those functions. Those are the components of this of this orthonormal E1, E2, E3, and uh, they're uh, functions of two variables, the, the two variables are being the, the coordinates on S, local coordinates on S. So we're doing much better here. We can not only um, prove the existence of large collections of typically orthogonal webs, but we can see that the initial data we get to specify can be defined all the way along a surface S, and the surface could be very large. It doesn't have to be bounded. It could be any surface whatsoever. So that's uh, that's re really an, 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 a, a more global result in the sense it's global along S. We, uh, we construct with global initial data defined along S, but it's it's on not uh, it's not global across S. It only uh, it only produces a triply orthogonal web in some little thickening of S into a three-dimensional open set uh, near S. It does it's it's global along S uh, where the initial data is specified, but it's not uh, global across S because it only produces a little tiny uh, neighborhood of S maybe in which the triply orthogonal web is defined. Okay, so we want to prove this result and we want to show this actually falls out from the cauchy kovalevsky theorem as we've stated it. Let's see the proof. I won't give all the details. Um, again, the details are done in more carefully in the lecture notes. But we can uh, recall that we did look at triply orthogonal webs before, and we computed out the integral elements. The integral elements were given by the connection forms, the gamma ij's, or certain multiples, these pij's, of the soldering forms, the omega i's. Um, every integral element was uniquely specified by the values of these p constants, these pij's. So if you have two integral elements, you want to see whether or not they, uh, they contain a common hypersurface. These integral elements are three-dimensional, and we want to know whether or not it's possible for two of them to intersect on a hypersurface, in, in a hyperplane, in other words, and to an intersect in a plane. So if we had two such, let's write one of them as gamma is p omega, where I mean by that, of course, the gamma ij's are the p i j omegas as, 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 in the, as in the matrix that you can see there. Um, so if gamma is p omega and another integral element is gamma is p plus q omega, um, so then we could ask whether or not those three-dimensional subspaces, those three-dimensional integral elements of our system happen to contain a two-plane in common. And that's just a question of linear algebra. You can calculate out that those two have a two-plane in common if and only if q vanishes along a plane that contains a coordinate axis. And I'll leave you to, te to check that. Uh, to, to work that out in detail. Um, so the characteristic variety consists of those, um, those hyperplanes in an integral element which contain a coordinate axis. In other words, the hyperplanes which have uh, psi 1 is 0 or psi 2 is 0 or psi 3 is 0 as their components. And so what we're, what we're looking for are um, characteristic, um, uh, characteristic uh, hyperplanes and as long as we have E1, E2, and E3 not tangent to S, this can't happen. These, these things can't occur. There are no characteristic hyperplanes. So I'll leave you to check all the linear algebra and convince yourself that that's the, that's the condition we check. But it's, it's fairly easy at least to see that this is a linear algebra problem. 
and that it isn't particularly difficult to compute out the conditions under which these things um, these things are characteristics. And so putting it all together, we have a Kosciuszko-Vlaszka theorem for exterior differential systems, which is somewhat nicer than the Kosciuszko-Vlaszka theorem in Cauchy form that we started with. It applies to a variety of different problems. Um, and what's really striking about it is it allows global initial data. In that uh, triply orthogonal web problem, we picked a surface. And we could pick a very, very complicated surface. And we don't have to have it be a surface where we know how to write down some kind of local coordinate description. But we only get local solutions near that initial data. So we specify some initial data globally, but it only constructs local solutions. We only get local solvability. So, OK, so next time, we're going to try to uh, prove the Kosciuszko-Vlaszka or the, the cartan kaler theorem uh, using this Kosciuszko-Vlaszka theorem, and uh, we'll we'll see then that we can get a much stronger result than the Kosciuszko-Vlaszka theorem, um, and we can also use this variant of the Kosciuszko-Vlaszka theorem to allow ourselves to construct solutions in cartan kaler using some uh, non-characteristic initial data that might also be global initial data producing local solutions.